I think it's safe to say at this point that Loki has become one of the most influential and beloved film villains of all time. Appearing in more Marvel films than some actual Avengers, Loki is the guy that everybody seems to love to hate. But I have to admit to you that when a Loki show was announced, personally I thought to myself, why? What is the point of this? Isn't he dead in the MCU? What is this even going to be? And out of the first wave of shows, including WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Hawkeye, and Loki, this show was my least anticipated. But then the show dropped, and with it, my jaw. The show is absolutely pushing the boundaries of the MCU. It's included a ton of new lore, a suite of breathtaking performances, and even introduced us to the most powerful new threat that the multiverse has ever known, Kang. But at the end of the day, the show was really made by the performances of a suite of variant Lokis, each from a different universe. Marvel really said, if you like one Loki, you're gonna love 20 of them. Today's video is going to attempt to break down the comic origins or whatever history we have for each of the variant Lokis that appeared in season one of Loki. However, before we begin, we wanna thank the sponsor of today's video, Keeps. Two thirds of men will experience some form of male pattern baldness before they're 35. Loki is clearly in the one third of men that doesn't have an issue with this. Little known trivia fact, Stan Lee originally had Loki as the god of thick hair flips. See that? That's volume, boys. But for those of us without frost giant genes, Keeps is a subscription service that partners men with doctors to help treat male pattern baldness. With Keeps, a real licensed doctor will review your specific hair loss scenario online and recommend the right treatment plan for you. Then, your treatment is shipped directly to your door every three months. With hair loss, prevention is the key, and Keeps can take four to six months to start seeing results, so the time to act is now. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash key issues or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash key issues. Each Loki has their own relevant history. Some are torn straight out of the pages of comics and some were created just for this show. We will try to do our best to explain their comic origins if they have them, as well as any relevant history they have within the MCU. So without further ado, let's begin. The first variant of Loki we encounter is the main character of the show, who we will primarily refer to as simply Loki. This Loki is actually a timeline variant of the main MCU's Loki. Now, it is easy to forget that this Loki is not the same one that we saw die during Infinity War. This Loki is instead plucked from a divergent timeline that was created when Tony Stark, Captain America, Hulk, and Ant-Man went back in time for their Infinity Gem heist. This Loki, we're not really going to cover the comic book origins of, because he is, for the most part, a mixture of various interpretations of Loki from the comics. However, one thing to keep in mind is that this version of the character has learned of the events he was destined to accomplish, but he did not personally live through those events. This version of Loki's Nexus event, or the event that caused him to be targeted by the Time Variance Authority, was when he escaped Avengers custody using the Tesseract and fled, an event that was not destined to happen. Next up, we have Sylvie, the female variant of Loki from an alternate Asgard, and this version of Loki is actually based off of a character named Sylvie Lushton, the second Enchantress from the comics. Key issues being the forward-thinking geniuses that we are already have a full, masterful video that explains the character's origins and a brief bit of their history, so feel free to check out that video rather than have me recap the whole thing here. Sylvie was introduced in Dark Avengers, Young Avengers number one, but as time went on, we learned that she was created by the main Loki as an experiment. Within the MCU, this version of Loki was pruned from her reality for offenses committed against the sacred timeline. Sylvie was able to hide from the TVA by jumping into variant timelines that all contained cataclysmic world-ending events. Places the TVA would never think to look for her. Her nexus event, or reason for being targeted by the TVA, is, at this time, not clearly understood. We can spend all day speculating that perhaps Kang knew she was a threat and targeted her for that reason, but ultimately we don't know yet. However, I like to think that she was pruned for love. Next up is Kid Loki, a character that I may end up making a comic origins or history video on, but for the time being, just know that Kid Loki in the show is based around a similar character from the comics who was a reincarnated version of Loki. 
Kid Loki first debuted in Thor 617, and his background is fairly complicated. During the events of the crossover event Siege, Loki was killed by an insanely powerful entity known as the Void. However, seeing as no one is ever truly dead in comics, we learned that Loki was actually able to manipulate Hela into taking his name out of the Book of Hell, allowing himself to be reborn after the Void killing him, essentially sparing him from a true death. Loki was reincarnated into the body of a young boy named Serum, and eventually comes to learn of his own wicked past and history of villainy. Now, Kid Loki in the show appears to be the self-proclaimed King of the Void, and leader of a band of variant Lokis that survive and live within the Void, a place at the end of time occupied by the reality-eating Eliath, and also Kang. We know that Kid Loki's nexus event was that he killed his universe's Thor as well, but that's really all we know about him up until now. Next up is the true MVP of the variant Loki squad, and that is Gator Loki. Not a comic book based character, but created for the show, this animal version of Loki is actually pretty interesting when all things are considered. First off, it begs the question, is this Loki from a variant time stream where animals rule? Is this a spell that was cast on another Loki causing him to resemble an alligator? We don't know, but I do know that there are now crocs with a Loki helmet on them that you can purchase, so Kevin Feige is obviously a mastermind. It is said that Gator Loki's nexus event was eating the wrong neighbor's cat. Not sure who that cat was, but let's just assume it was Kang's and he never forgave him. Next up, we have Loki the Boastful, who is also not a comic book based character. This character's nexus event was stated to be that he killed his universe as Iron Man and Captain America, and claimed all six Infinity Stones. However, one thing to consider here is that he's called Boastful Loki for a reason. We don't know if these events actually even occurred, as lying is the main MO of every Loki in existence. Boastful Loki also appears to carry a pretty interesting weapon in the form of a magical hammer that is very similar to Mjolnir in appearance, but we don't know if it's actually a version of Mjolnir at this point, we just know that he carries it, probably to make himself look cool. We do, however, know that this Loki is a rat, who turns on his crew in an attempt to become the new ruler of the Void, aligning with our next variant. President Loki is a character who's based off of a comic book called Vote Loki. Vote Loki was a limited series meant to mock the 2016 presidential election, and the central narrative of the story is that Loki runs for office and his platform is that he's going to be truthful about the fact that he is willing to lie to the American people. We all know that politicians are liars, it's kind of their thing. But, as opposed to other candidates that will just lie and pretend that they're not being self-serving, Loki tries to be upfront and honest about the fact that he plans to lie to the American people a lot. The series follows a reporter as she attempts to unravel Loki's aspirations towards political power, and in the end, he ends up being unsuccessful in his campaign. But it is heavily implied that he was working for another politician and he meant to throw the election in the first place. This version of Loki attempts to take over and rule the Void as well, but he ends up losing a hand to the coolest Loki, Gator Loki. Next up, we have Classic Loki, who resembles the character as he was shown in his first appearance, Journey into Mystery 85, all the way through the modern age. This version of Loki, at least in appearance, is probably the closest to a comic accurate portrayal of the character as we're ever going to get. This version of Loki appears to be one of the most powerful Asgardians we've seen, capable of conjuring a duplicate Asgard, which is the largest conjuration we've ever seen a Loki attempt. This Loki's backstory is essentially the natural culmination of the direction we saw the main MCU version of Loki heading. This version of Loki was not killed by Thanos, but instead he hid, disguised as debris. After he flees from Thanos, he instead decides to send himself in exile, where he lives for many many years until he finds himself missing his brother Thor and Asgard. He left isolation and was immediately pruned by the TVA and sent to the Void where he lived for presumably a fairly long time, aligning with other variant Lokis. Classic Loki assists Sylvie and the main variant of Loki that we follow in the final battle against Eliath, but he's killed in the process. And the last two variants I want to discuss are variants that have already been pruned, shown briefly by Mobius during his mission briefing to the TVA agents. 
These two variants, which I have dubbed Monstrous Loki and Frost Giant Loki, were first shown in the Mighty Thor 3, during an event that came before the War of the Realms. Loki arrived in Alfheim to speak with the new acting Thor, Jane Foster, about ending the War of Realms. But Loki didn't know that it was Jane under the helmet. Jane was already quite familiar with Loki's bullshit and immediately attempted to kick his ass. Loki revealed that he had an army of magical counterparts, essentially shades of himself and forms that he had taken in the past. This was the first time that we had seen the monstrous and frost giant forms of Loki, and they don't really talk or do much, they just battle Thor and get clapped. These variants within the MCU are all pruned before the show begins, so we don't really know much about them, but maybe we might see them in the future. There are also two other variants shown by Mobius during his mission briefing. This hipster version of Loki, who's also part of President Loki's crew, and Tour de France Loki, but I believe that both of these characters are essentially jokes with no comic counterparts that I could find. But if you are able to find something on them, then hit me up in the comments. But that is about it for every single variant that we could find in the first season of Loki. Now, if you guys have questions or want to discuss your favorite version of Loki, hit us up with a comment down in the comment section below. This has been Nick with Key Issues. Thank you guys for watching this video, and remember the motto, Loki over everything.